I invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 13 as we begin a new sermon series that will take us over the coming weeks and months of the summer where we look at the life of the Apostle Paul and the early church to see how the gospel spread, how the gospel changed lives and transformed the world. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear and receive God's word, we begin with prayer. And so I invite you to pray with me. Our first prayer is we pray for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would open them to receive the gospel of Jesus and God's word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they too would hear God's word, be encouraged and uplifted by it, and that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth for their lives. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach in accordance with God's word the truth of Jesus and his gospel of salvation for all who believe in him. Psalm 19 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So as we begin studying this second half of the book Acts, looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, before we get to Acts chapter 13, I have a couple other passages that I want us to look at and then ask you some questions that I want you to be encouraged, but also challenged by that we would consider for ourselves as followers of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, I know it's the Great Commission, this is supposed to be Pentecost Sunday, but the Great Commission doesn't happen without Pentecost, without the Holy Spirit coming into the church and inspiring and leading the apostles. But in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus looks at his disciples. He's got 11 apostles gathered together with him, and he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, if you've been coming to our church for a while, you know I've read this and shared this and proclaimed this passage to you many times, but it's known as the Great Commission. And here's what I want you to see. Jesus says this to 11 guys, and they are not the smartest, best guys in the whole world. Right? We know that just from cultural and historical things. We also know that from passages in the scripture where they are messing it up and they're getting it wrong. They're living in fear and cowering and hiding. And Jesus looks at that collection of guys who get it wrong all the time, who don't fully understand his power and who he is. Because earlier in Matthew 28, two verses before the Great Commission, it says that some of them, while they were worshiping Jesus, also doubted. So there are a group of people that don't always get it. They get it wrong. They wrestle with belief and doubts all at the same time. They live in fear so much so that they hide and don't go into the world. And Jesus looks at them and says, you're the team I want. Any of you back then, if you were in Jesus' shoes, would have picked a different team, right? Anybody ever been through an interview process? No, yeah, show of hands, like, yeah, right, right? And how much pressure comes on that? Imagine if you were there, and they're like, well, tell us about, about yourself. You're like, well, I'm really afraid to do this job. Well, what do you mean, how afraid are you? Well, I'm probably never gonna leave my house to actually do it. Okay, well, we got an exam for you. We're gonna ask you some questions and you get like half of them wrong like Peter did. You don't even get a D. You just completely fail the test. And then they ask you, do you think you'll be good at it? Like, yeah, probably not, right? Because they doubt it. Now, how many of you think I nailed that interview and I'm totally getting hired? Right? But this is the group of people that Jesus looks at, these 11 apostles, And he says to them, I want you to go into the whole world and change it and share the gospel. Now, just think about that for a minute, how intimidating that would be. Let's not just beat up on the apostles. We can relate to them a lot of ways, right? Like, I would have some doubts. Are you telling me there's 11 of us here? 
We've never left our hometowns and country, and it's not that big. Do you want us to go into the whole world, Jesus? So here's my first question. I just want you to sit there for a moment and think. If you are one of the 11, and Jesus, through his word, is telling you that you are part of this mission, here's what I want you to do. How would you respond? What would be your first step? What strategies and plans would you come up with? Now, in Acts chapter one, right before his ascension, Jesus gathers together his disciples once again. There's about 120 of them all together in the whole church. And he says to them in verse eight of chapter one of Acts, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the, <clears throat> and to the ends of the whole earth. So it's almost like Jesus is just like, in case you didn't hear it the first time. Or maybe because of your doubts, you just thought, after the Gospel of Matthew, he wasn't talking to me, he was just talking to Peter and James and John. Jesus looks at his disciples, at his followers, and he says, here's what's going to happen in your life. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He will empower you, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, here's what I want you to do as my church to be my witnesses, to share the gospel, to tell the Jesus story in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And again, if you were in that group of people, what would be your first response, your first reaction? Now, I know we're in church so that the ch- everybody know the Sunday school answer kind of thing, right? You're like, well, the right answer is this. What I really believe... <laughs> Or what I really feel is this, right? <clears throat> so this Sunday school answer is to like jump up for joy and say, all right, Jesus, let me go. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, give me the Holy Spirit now. Let me go and do this. But oftentimes, if we're honest, if we're willing to be humble enough to confess our shortcomings like the early church, we don't always jump up to the task. We don't always get excited. We do what they did, which is, not leave Jerusalem at all. In fact, there's eight chapters of the book of Acts before any of them actually leave Jerusalem. And the reason they leave Jerusalem is not because of their own choice. God sent persecution to wake them up and get them going. So we could say, oh, the Sunday school answer is, yeah, I'm all in, Jesus. But if we're honest, we're more like them that we might want to admit, which is, I'm going to wait until what? Well, we could say, oh, well, they had to wait for the Holy Spirit, Pastor, and you'd be correct. They had to wait one chapter. Very next chapter is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit shows up in a powerful way, and Jesus is like, see, I did it. Very, you just turn the page, y'all. That's all you got to do, and it's there. And yet what really moves them to doing what Jesus had told them to do is the Holy Spirit and then God kind of disciplining them and kind of kicking them out the door and saying, no, I really meant it. You really need to, to go and do this. And they do. They eventually follow. So here's my question is, we have this hesitancy in our hearts, right? Pentecost is a wonderful day. It's awesome to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit in a powerful, unique way to empower the church for the mission of the church, which we would all agree is the Great Commission, right? I've never met Christians that disagreed with the Great Commission. We read it in Acts 1, we read it in Matthew 28, and all of your heads are nodding, going, yeah, Jesus said it. How many of you think Jesus means the things he says in the Bible? Right? Certainly when he says, for God so loved the whole world, we're like, amen, Jesus. Even Lutherans will say amen to that. As shy as we are. When Jesus says, come unto me all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. How many of you say amen to that? You're like, yeah, Jesus really means I'm going to turn to Jesus today. And then Jesus also says, I want you to go to the whole world and share the message of Jesus and the gospel. I don't know if he was totally serious, right? I, did, I have had people in my life tell me that 
well, that's the job of the pastor, which is true, um, but what they meant by that was, it's not my job, it's, it's I'm pointing to myself, right, I'm not gonna confuse everybody. Right, what they meant was, it's only the job of the pastor, except for Jesus tells his whole church to do this. So you see what it means, like part of our struggle as sinful human beings is, yeah, Jesus is Lord and he's my savior and I believe he means what he says in the Bible, but I'm much more enthusiastic about certain parts that he says and not other parts and other things that he says. So my first question is, if you were given the great commission like the disciples and you were standing there like them, like we do as human beings with our own fears and doubts and concerns and worries, how would you respond? If you took seriously like they did, Jesus says he wants us to go into Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth, right? He wants us to go into our cities and our neighborhoods and our communities, right? And just the ever expanding process of sharing the gospel. How would we respond? How would we accomplish it? Because here's the secret of Pentecost. If you believe in Jesus right now, you have the Holy Spirit in you just like they did in Acts chapter two. So you can't, that sound, I meant that both encouraging and also convicting for you. Encouraging meaning you have the Holy Spirit. Convicting in this, you don't have an excuse. You can't be like, oh, Pentecost never happened in my life. As soon as you believe and confess faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you just the same way he was in Peter and James and John and all the other apostles in Acts chapter two. So when we get to the point where we go, okay, I believe in Jesus, right? We believe what he says. We have the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible promises to us. Okay, so what now? What's the strategy, right? You notice how Jesus just says, I want you to go? Let's be honest, how many of you are very organized, detail-oriented human beings? Anybody, anybody wanna admit, don't be ashamed, all right? Let's just, to make you not feel bad, how many of you are not that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's a, we're all just different, all right? Call it gifts of the Holy Spirit. God has designed us differently for his glory and that's wonderful, all right? But many of us, well, we're feeling a little trepidation, and Jesus is looking at you going, I want you, and he's pointing at you. He's po looking at you in the eyes in the crowd, and he says, I want you to be my witnesses here, 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 and you're like, well, that's kind of like everywhere I go, and he's like, yeah, exactly, that's the point, everywhere you go. And you feel a little, a little heartburn, <laughs> a little queasiness in your gut, like, really, me? Well, how many of you would just wanna ask Jesus, forget the spiritual stuff and just be like, can you give me some instructions? This is, it's okay, don't feel bad, right? He's like, I know, I just want you to go. Let's be honest, how many of you are like, I would like an instruction manual for this retreat that we're about to go on, Jesus, right? Yeah, that'd be nice. Now, one more passage. Acts chapter nine is the conversion of the Apostle Paul, where he goes from Saul to Paul, he goes from hating the church to being one of its champions. Acts chapter nine, we're gonna read in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, he says to Ananias, go, for he is, that is Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So this is an individualized great commissioning where after meeting the resurrected Christ, Jesus says about Paul, the great persecutor of the church, I have chosen him, I have redeemed him so that he can go and proclaim the gospel to Gentiles and Jews and kings and queens and rulers and all the people that he meets as he goes about. and there's still no instruction manual. How annoying is that for some of you? 
right? You're like, awesome. Even, even the worst sinner, like Paul, can be redeemed and brought into the church and be used mightily by God for his glory, right? That's part of that story. That is so beautiful and amazing. And yet, what is so infuriating for many of us is he didn't say how. How many of you want the how? Like, okay, Lord, like, we're going to go. What now? Right? I'm here. Right? You are where you are, right? Everywhere I go, share the gospel. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, this is what we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 13. It is the story of Acts is the story of Jesus taking ordinary people like you and me, the disciples, People filled with fears and doubts and insecurities, people that feel inadequate, unequipped, all those things, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit saying, you're the ones that I'm gonna use to change the world. You are the ones I'm gonna use to change lives and bring about salvation in hearts and minds. Acts is also the story of God taking people like Saul, who everybody in the church, when they knew him, as Saul would have said, he is the worst sinner. And that sounds really mean, but in fact, Saul himself in his own letters would say, I am the worst of all sinners. And the story of Acts, the story of the gospel is God taking people also like that and redeeming them by the power of Jesus and his grace and mercy and saying, but now you belong to me, I've transformed your whole life and I'm going to use you for my glory. This is a beautiful story for all of us. Whether we feel like I am filled with doubts and fears and insecurities, there's no way God could use me, or you are filled with guilt and shame, and you think, I am like Saul. I have done so many wrong things. If people found out, if God found out, they would reject me and never use me. And yet, and to both people, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus declares to you, you are forgiven and loved. I have chosen you, and you, whichever side you are on, are going to be used by him to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the world. And in Acts 13, and we're going to spend the rest of the summer going through the second half of Acts, we're going to see the how. How do you do that? Now, before you fall asleep, I will just tell you right now, in case you don't make it to the end, here is the secret of how the Bible tells us to do it, how Peter and James and John and Paul and all these heroes of the faith did it. They shared the gospel. There you go. Write that one down. It'll change your life. They, they shared the story of Jesus. Now, none of you are reacting very excitedly, and I'm a little hurt. <laughs> now, here's why, if we're honest. Right? Is it okay to be honest in church? We want it to be more complicated than that. We do. We want some grand strategy. We want some very long instruction booklet that gives us all the details. We want it to be bigger. We want it to be more complicated and all, more intricate, and all of these things. But if you read the Bible, you read the story of Acts where we are so overwhelmed by all the miracles and all the transformation and all the conversions, what you will find is that the way it happened is they simply shared the story of Jesus. And I'm telling you, and the Bible is telling you, the story of Jesus is enough to save people. Acts chapter 2, right? 3,000 plus people get converted and baptized on the spot. And you know what Peter did in his sermon that changed all those lives? He told them that Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, and then God raised them from the dead. And then throughout the book of Acts, every single sermon you will find says the exact same thing. The secret 
to you and me as Jesus' witnesses and disciples in the world, the secret to a church changing its community and city and the whole world is not some complex secret thing that we've got to study our whole lives to figure out. It is this, the sharing of the gospel, the sharing of the story of Jesus. So in Acts chapter 13, Paul, who's going by Paul now, He's been transformed, been redeemed by Jesus. And he's going out and he's sharing the gospel. And every time he goes into a new city, he finds people that believe in God, but they don't know Jesus yet. And he goes to their worship places. And whether they're Jews or Gentiles, he begins telling them about Jesus. If you look at every missionary trip, every encounter of Paul, he's got the same exact strategy. He just walks up to people. He finds people that don't know Jesus, and you know what he does? Anybody. He tells people about Jesus. I'm just, I love you. I think you're awesome. You're not going to come up with a better strategy than the Apostle Paul. <laughs> just don't think you are. I don't think I am. So here's where we pick it up in Acts chapter 13. He is speaking both to Jews and to Gentiles, people that believe in God but they don't know Jesus, people that are spiritual and have pagan gods but they don't know Jesus. In verse 26, he speaks to them, brothers and sisters, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God. So he's saying to those who are Jewish by ethnicity and descent and those who are Gentiles but they're spiritual and they're interested and they believe in God. To us has been sent the message of this salvation. So he's not going to go into some grand argument that you and I can't repeat. He's not going to go into some complex theological doctrinal list of things. He's just going to tell them what? The story of Jesus, the story of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize Jesus nor understand the utterances of the prophets, the, the Bible, what it said about him, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. So he's saying there is people who love God, have read the scriptures, but here is their problem. They missed Jesus. And in fact, in Gospel of John chapter 5, Jesus will tell them that. Of, you scour the scriptures looking for life, but you fail to see that they point to me. This is important for us as you and I share the gospel with people. There will be very many people in your life who will consider themselves religious. Who will think to themselves, I'm saved. And if you talk to them about it, they'll be like, well, because... I go to church or, yeah, I've read the Bible. I try to do what it says. I try to be a good person, those kinds of things. And I guarantee you'll meet people like this and you have people like this in your life. And they need to hear the gospel because this is what we see Paul doing. He's evangelizing people who did what? Really religious, knew God, read the Bible, but what were they missing? Jesus and his salvation for them. Oh, one of my good friends, well, we met him. It's weird to become friends with a pastor. I understand that, okay? But when I first met him, we were talking about religious things and that kind of stuff, and he was coming over to our house for Bible studies and things like that. And as I got to know him, we were talking about spiritual things. His whole argument was that his view of world was, if you believe in God and you just do what the Bible says, you'll be good. Right, just, just try to live your life according to the rules and God will be happy with you. Which, by the way, is an incredibly common sentiment among people that will claim to be Christian and go to church and be very religious on the outside. And right, if all I just do is just look at the rules, follow the rule book, try to do the things that God says and then God will be what? He'll be pleased with me. Now, on the surface, he looks like someone who doesn't need the gospel. Because what does he do? He read his Bible, goes to church, talks about God. 
pretty good person. He was a nice guy. Still a nice guy. (laughs) These are the kind of people that Paul is going to. He's saying, but here's what you're missing. You're missing Jesus. You're missing the point of Jesus. And so one time he and I were talking because he was going through a difficult season of life where things were not working out. And he came to me, and he wanted to talk about it. He wanted encouragement about it. And he's saying, things aren't going well. And I thought, like, if I just do this and that and everything, then God will be okay. And I thought we had an agreement. And I looked to him, and I said, well, and he's like, well, what's my problem? I feel like I got a bad deal with God. That was his feeling in this matter. And I looked to him, and I said, well, your real problem is you don't know Jesus and the gospel at all, which (laughs) he did not take very well. Okay. <laughs> in the moment. He got a little offended. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, I'm doing everything. I got it and all this stuff and all of his arguments. And I said, no, but you don't, you don't actually understand Jesus and the gospel. That, that Jesus is about your salvation, that God put him to death, that he rose again for you to have forgiveness in life, that he did this for you so you would be set free from following all the rules and having to please God and perform for him all the time. And so we have a responsibility to share the gospel with the people in our lives because there are people in our lives who don't know Jesus. And sometimes, yeah, they look like people who absolutely hate the church want nothing to do with faith, don't want anything to do with Jesus. And we're like, oh, that's real obvious, right? We gotta gotta go to the ends of the earth. But sometimes there are people in our lives who have the outward appearance of being very religious, saying they love God, they know God, but they don't know the salvation of Jesus. They don't know the message and the comfort that it is by his grace alone and all of his work alone and that they can be set free from the burden of always having to perform, to please God. Right? And so Paul goes to these people and his strategy is that. He proclaims the gospel. He says, this salvation is for us. In verse 28, though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. I'm telling you right now, Paul was an amazing preacher, way better than any of us. But you could give this sermon if you paid attention to what we just read. You, right now, if you believe in Jesus, could give this sermon of Paul. Just copyright, it don't matter, he's not gonna sue you. Okay? Like, just plagiarize the thing. What did he do? He told them what? The story of Jesus. Hey, here is Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He did all of these things. And then he was put to death on a cross because people condemned him for things that he was not guilty of. That is what? The story of the gospel. Him taking on our sin, even though he was what? Sinless and perfect. And so the strategy for us, you and me, joining the apostles and Paul and all of them and sharing the gospel, being witnesses of Jesus in the world to the people in our lives, is simply sharing the story of Jesus. Now, verse 30 is the most important verse in the whole New Testament, in my opinion. Notice I didn't say it's one of my favorites that you all laugh at me and tease me about. It is one of my favorites. But I want you to circle, highlight, memorize this one because this is what it all comes down to. The story of Jesus. He is condemned, right? He's innocently put to death on a cross. He's laid in a tomb. But verse 30 is everything. But God raised him from the dead. That is the gospel. That is the good news of salvation, that sin and death have been conquered, and we can find comfort in that. Why? Because God raised Jesus from the dead. And so when you and I share the good news of Jesus, I want to encourage you to share the whole story. 
Yes, he lived, and yes, he died, but most importantly, according to the New Testament, is this, that God raised him from the dead. So the reason you and I have comfort, the reason you and I have salvation is not because Jesus died, because he died and he also rose again from the dead so that we know death and sin have been conquered on our behalf and we have been set free. And so when you go into the world and you share the gospel, remember verse 30, please. Share that good news because it tells people no matter how dark and, and how burdened and how guilt and shame riddled life may feel, no matter how heavy their hearts might be, there is good news in the darkness, which is, but God raised him from the dead. And then Paul goes on in verses, 30, uh, verses 31 and 32. For many days he appeared to those who came up from, with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, and we are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers has been fulfilled, right? So Paul's saying, we're now the witnesses of this because we are the ones who know who Jesus is. We are the ones who know that God has kept his promises and so now we are the ones who share that good news with the world. And now if we go to verses 38 and 39, this is why it's gonna matter so much. Because I'm assuming if you've been a Christian for a while and go to church a while, you have heard more than one sermon about the Great Commission, right? Just show of hands, how many of you have heard it? If you've come to this church, you've heard it before, right? <laughs> Yeah, heard that one before. And go out the door and be like, that was neat. But verses 38 and 39, I want you to see why it matters so much. Because at the end of the day, I think this is why we often struggle with it. I could convince you that the Great Commission is for you by God's word. I can encourage you that you have the Holy Spirit empowering you to be God's witnesses just like the disciples. But we're not going to move to action. We're not going to open our mouths to speak the gospel until we realize why it matters so much. So verses 38 and 39. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, that through this man, through Jesus, forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. It's proclaimed to you. And Paul's talking to people who were super religious, loved God, did all the good things, followed the commandments, knew the scriptures and yet they were missing Jesus. They're, that wasn't enough. They still needed to hear what? That it's through Jesus that you get the forgiveness of sins. It's like my friend who would say, I'm a Christian, I go to church and I read the Bible and I try to do all the good things that God wants me to do. And yet, when he came to a crisis faith, it was then he realized, I didn't really understand that it was for the forgiveness of sin. There are people in your lives that need to hear that it, it is for the forgiveness of sins that Jesus came, and it's for them. This is why Paul says in verse 39, and by him, everyone who believes is set free from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. What he means is you are being set free from having to perform continuously to keep God pleased with you. You are set free from having to earn God's favor and love in your life. You are set free from having to keep him from being angry at you. You are set free to know that he simply loves you because of Jesus. And dear friends, you and I need to hear that a lot. Luther said we had to hear it every day. And there are people in your lives that on the outside look incredibly religious, but they don't know that it was him coming to proclaim forgiveness of their sins so they could be set free from having to perform all the time. The other thing that it sets you free from are the other group of people that Paul was talking to in this sermon, which was people that were spiritual but not religious. People who live in their lives uncertain of, does God love me? Can I know God? Can I know for certain 
that he forgives me and accepts me and loves me for who I am. Because that's the opposite end of this, right? The one end is I must perform and I will make God happy and pleased. The other end is often it's a lost cause and it's pointless. I'll never measure up. And Paul is saying the gospel sets you free from both of those. It sets you free from I've always got to keep performing to keep God happy and pleased with me. Otherwise, he'll be disappointed or he will be angry with me and he will punish me. It also sets you free from all the doubts and insecurities and uncertainties of does he actually love me? And Paul looks at both groups of people and he simply shares the story of Jesus. Because here's the reality. Every single person you meet needs the story of Jesus. Every single person you meet needs to know that through Jesus, God forgives them totally and completely. Every single person you meet needs to know you are set free from having to earn God's salvation, earn God's favor, earn God's love in your life. You already have it perfectly in Jesus Christ. And this is why the Great Commission matters. Because people matter. The people in your lives right now, people you might not have met yet, they all matter. And here's my proof that they matter. Jesus said, John 3, 16, the one verse everybody knows. For God so loved the what? The whole world that he sent Jesus, right? So that all could have what? Forgiveness and salvation. So that all people could be set free and know you are loved and forgiven by Jesus. So the Great Commission is not something that matters to us just because, hey, <laughs> we wanna put it in our mission statement as a church, we wanna check it off the list and say, see, we did some things for it. The Great Commission matters because people matter. And every single person needs the story of Jesus. So it's our job, it's our responsibility by the power of the Holy Spirit to join Paul when he says, and now we are all witnesses to this Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for the gospel that through your life, death, and resurrection, the proclamation of forgiveness of sins has been declared to us and that those who believe in you have been set free. Holy Spirit, empower us, lead us, and guide us so that we may be witnesses to the story of Jesus through all the people that we meet in our lives, and that we will remember that you love every person, and every person needs the story of Jesus, needs the reminder that forgiveness is for them through him. Salvation is for them through him, and they are set free by him to know the love of God. In your name we pray, amen.